So uh, Jeffrey Hinton and couple of others have independently come up with this algorithm uh, at different times. Basically, that we can uh, train neural networks using uh, uh, using chain rule of derivatives, and we can store partial derivatives during the forward pass, so that the backward pass simply amounts to multiplying the derivatives coming back. And we saw how that worked when everything was a scalar, when the input was a scalar, every weight was a scalar. So we had only one neuron in every layer, only one bias in every layer and so forth. Now, what if your inputs are, are vectors and consequently your uh, weights are matrices and your biases are also vectors? Then what will happen? So we uh, let's take a look at uh, how that works. And uh, basically what we need to do is we need to introduce a concept called Jacobian. And this Jacobian is useful when you have. Uh, so it's basically a generalization of a gradient. In gradient, you had multiple inputs and a single output. And we were taking the partial derivative of that single output with respect to each of the multiple inputs. Now, what if your outputs are also multiple? Then basically we will have to have a, a matrix of derivatives of partial derivatives, which will be uh, for each derivative of each output with respect to each of the other input, the partial derivative, and that is going to be the Jacobian matrix. So you can think of neural network as uh, basically these function blocks of functions chained together and you have multiple inputs to one function and what comes out of it are multiple outputs which are what I mean by multiple outputs is for example you could have multiple neurons in that layer which is a hyperparameter of that layer and that can be uh, chained into another function and that function may have multiple outputs as well and then finally we may have multiple outputs as well so if you take each of these outputs of one layer and take its derivative with respect to each of the inputs of the previous layer or outputs of the previous layer uh, then we can get a matrix of de partial derivatives which is exactly what jacobian is so let's say we have a vectored value function f of x and it actually has two different dimensions f1 and f2 uh, which is what is shown here and x itself has three dimensions x1 x2 and x3 so basically you have f1 of x1 x2 and x3 and you have f2 of x1 and x2 and x3 right so now if we take its uh, derivative uh, so basically then derivative of what with respect to what so we will basically say that we will take the derivative of one uh, the the vector uh, vector value function with respect to uh, the first input and then the vector value function with respect to the second input and with respect to the third input so these are going to be the columns and the rows are going to be different dimensions of f so this is f1 this is f2 and this is going to be x1 x2 and x3 so this we will get a 2 by 3 matrix in this case where your uh, uh, your rows are going to be defined by the uh, the dimensions of the output and your columns are going to be defined by the dimensions of the input so this is uh, the concept of a jacobian now think about uh, if you have uh, three outputs here and you have four out uh, inputs to this layer the jacobian is going to be of what dimension it is going to have uh, three rows and it is going to have four columns and what is that so basically uh, if you think of this as um, uh, so so let's uh, back up a minute so between each layer let's introduce something else right so in a neural network what we will do is we will treat the point wise nonlinearity as separate from the weight multiplication right so what we have is let's say we have input x so we have x1 x2 x3 right and that is being multiplied with weight matrix w1 Right, I'm ignoring the bias for now, right? And then what comes out of it is uh, we apply some nonlinearity sigma. So let's say that sigma could be sigmoid or non uh, or relu, and what comes out of that, right? Uh, that is multiplied with weight matrix W two, and let's say what what we get out of that is uh, is some output, and then we can have another sigma and so forth. So this is the general structure of layers being stacked together so the partial derivative or around this block 
is straightforward because it's a point wise nonlinearity. However, when we go from here to here, uh, the partial derivative uh, is precisely w itself, right? That's what we saw in the previous uh, previous uh, part of this lecture. Uh, so that uh, the the del of uh, uh, the del of z z l divided by del of z a l minus one is precisely w l, right? So now this w itself is that matrix the jacobian matrix itself it can be used as a jacobian matrix itself for this particular module so the the concept of a jacobian is also tied to the weights the the jacobian matrix of this module is precisely the weight matrix okay so now uh, with this you probably have a good idea of how the back propagation works for even neural networks that have vector outputs uh, have a vector of neurons in every layer and so forth. Now let's talk about uh, what happens when we string a lot of these layers together, right? Uh, so there are certain uh, ambiguities that we have in this neural network that need to be controlled. So the first one is that we can generally uh, scale all the weights and biases of a of a neural network by a particular factor, and we may not even have a qualitative change in the output. So what I mean by that is let's say you have wx plus b right and we are taking relu of that right if i instead take uh, some factor alpha so alpha w so long as alpha is greater than one alpha wx plus alpha b the sign of the expression inside the parenthesis does not change right so because the sign does not change qualitatively whatever gets mapped to zero versus whatever get maps to identity of relu uh, does not change so i have this ambiguity that these weights and biases are not unique to get the same function done so that's number one point number one right uh, so this is uh, less of a problem sometimes in sigmoid because in sigmoid it is not uh, piecewise linear it is a continuous curve so which part of that continuous curve we are operating upon uh, is uh, dependent on the on the on the uh, norm of w and b but be that as it may this creates a problem in fact uh, sometimes if we try to let's say normalize the inputs if we try to uh, make sure that the inputs are not too high and so forth uh, what will happen is the compensation can come from change in the uh, multiplicative factor or an internal scaling of w and b and you can still get the same behavior from the neural network so this points to the uh, to the issue of trying to control uh, or trying to standardize uh, the weights and the biases in some sense and basically that leads to the idea of uh, uh, putting some penalty on l2 norm of w we will come to that in a bit uh, there's a uh, there is basically that helps you with with the regularization of the neural network also the second part of it is that once we string a lot of these modules together right we make it a very deep neural network right so let's say the inputs are going to the next layer and so this is your input and then what comes out is your output y right and so once we do back propagation we know that there is this factor w that is basically the der partial derivative at each point right and then there is this string of w's that get multiplied coming back together so what happens if on an average this multiplication of w is uh, is greater than one or less than one so if it is consistently less than one then these gradients coming back will become very very small so we can have vanishing vanishing gradients and if this uh, multiplication by w is such that uh, on an average it it leads to a larger magnitude or uh, mod of w is greater than 1 then we will have exploding gradients so we can have exploding or vanishing gradients whenever we have deep neural networks right so that is issue number 2 so one is that uh, the weights can biases can be a, can be scaled without changing the behavior of the neural network much second is that if all the weights are very small if you initialize them to be very small obviously all the neural networks are randomly initialized in the beginning uh, 
so if your initialization is such that you unnecessarily have very small absolute value of weights or norm of weights or very large absolute value or norm of weights then you can have exploding or vanishing gradients uh, for training the neural networks that means with one step of gradient descent your weights will become very large or very small and once they become zero then you can see that all the derivatives going backwards will be zero if they are very large then uh, you will get a not a number error so those that's the second problem with neural network the third problem with neural network is that uh, any time we have nl uh, outputs uh, nl outputs in one layer and nl plus 1 outputs in the second layer then basically we'll have the multiplication of the two as the number of weights so that your number of weight keeps increasing quite rapidly as you add neurons into different layers so you you pretty much uh, pretty quickly run into a situation where you have more unknowns than the number of training samples for deep neural networks so that's why uh, a lot of the recent research in the last 10 10 to 15 years has been in controlling these things so that we can train deeper neural networks without having a very large uh, explosion in the number of weights uh, we have new techniques for initializing weights so what what is even if we initialize them randomly so even if you uh, initialize it using a uniform random variable pseudo random variable the range of that is important that range cannot be too large or too small so things such as Xavier initialization or coming he initialization though they control they have derived formulas for what are the conditions on these uh, gradients coming back for deep neural networks that uh, that allow us to decide on the range of ran even for random initialization of weights so all these have to be kept in mind uh, which may not be those big an issue when you have a single hidden neuron uh, single hidden layer uh, and you have a shallow neural network but that is uh, basically pointing towards where the research in neural networks has been for the last uh, 10 years or so the third type of research is of course the structure of the layers the connectivity of the layers itself is very controlled now with the uh, convolution neural networks and long short term memories uh, uh, so so that we can train deeper neural networks so now let's look at one now that we know how to compute the gradient of the loss with respect to any of the parameters w1 w2 b1 and b2 let's look at how gradient descent would work right so gradient descent uh, as you all know uh, from the earlier part of uh, this course is quite simply taking small baby steps towards the negative side of the of the gradient so that you can reduce the loss so basically you will have an outer loop right so you will have a iteration loop right inside that iteration loop we will have a sample loop so what does that mean that uh, the iteration loop will go over all the samples and within each sample we will compute something right so what is in the sample loop basically when you are looking at a loss right so you are looking at the loss of all the training points x right with respect to the all the target values t so this is also a vector and this is a matrix right so this uh, is sum over all the individual training points and their targets right so your individual training points and your targets uh, their loss will be in the sample loop so we will compute l of xi and ti right so basically your loss will you will add up the loss here so your big l big loss okay is going to be capital l plus l of xi ti so this is sample loop over i and this is iteration loop over let's say n iterations right and uh, and we will also compute the derivative so we will also compute the gradient of l with respect to all the parameters theta right so theta is w1 w2 b1 and b2 
okay so this will also be added up so you will have gradient of l plus gradient of this uh, li right whichever is the is the one that you computed in the previous step right and we will uh, similarly have the entire loss function so, so that's what we have and then uh, uh, once we have computed the entire gradient then what we will say is that we will update that theta uh, it's going to be theta previous okay and uh, minus eta times uh, eta times this gradient of l theta what is eta eta is the uh, is the step size or the learning rate right so here there are a couple of things to note right so before we can update before we can update this is where the update is happening before we can update the parameters one time we have to go through all the samples in the inner loop right so if you have 1 million training samples you have to compute uh, you have to go through the inner loop 1 million times and whatever is the complexity of the inner loop times the number of samples right that much computations you have to do to get one update and then you have to do n updates and what is the breaking condition for n so either n is some fixed number like thousand or or the gradient does not change so if you take the mod of uh, of uh, del of l then that is quite small so if the gradient does not change quite uh, quite uh, quite a bit then that means we have reached a flat region of the loss and we will stop updating so one of the two conditions can be used for uh, this vanilla gradient update what vanilla means just plain that means a regular gradient descent uh, and that is because our loss has this sum structure and that sum is implemented in the inner loop uh, so the disadvantage of this is that even for one update we have to go through a lot of uh, iterations.